I should have mentioned at the beginning of the service that Elizabeth is with different saints this morning, so staying on the, the theme of saints. So uh, every time there is a national youth gathering, of which there is one next summer in Minneapolis, there, the ELCA has a leadership conference that includes two youth from every synod in the ELCA, and they gather in the city that will be hosting the National Youth Gathering. So Elizabeth is in Minneapolis with uh, about 150 youth and 200 people all together, I would imagine, as they celebrate and get ready um, for the National Youth Gathering this next summer. Um, of the two representatives from our Senate, one is uh, our daughter, Annika. So it's one of the empty spots in the pews here this morning. But at any rate, so here we are on All Saints Day. It's a day in which, um, in some parts of the world, are not so prominent in Protestant circles. But here in the United States, as Lutherans, we've grabbed onto this festival for many generations now, an understanding that in baptism, we are made saints of the church. And we think of all the saints that have gone on before. And these names that are with us, and particularly this year, Normally, we take kind of a 12-month window, and the candles represent this on the altar, the 12-month window of members who have died since the last All Saints Sunday. So the candles on the altar reflect that. But in keeping with this year, it feels as though it's been a 20-month year. Does anybody else feel like it's been a 20-month year? Yeah. It's, uh, and so the sense of the, the loss that we experienced during that time and these names uh, that we see in the slides, in the narthex, the names in the bulletin, we're mindful of, of all of those that we have lost in this, this last 20 months and an understanding of, of, of how we continue to be community but perhaps in different ways and in ways that are, that are challenging to us. I want to talk about the reading that we have for today from the Gospel of John. It's a familiar story in many ways, but I think all of us read it in ways that we're surprised by some of the minute details that come up in this story. It could be said a lot easier, Jesus wasn't there, Lazarus died, Jesus showed up, people were unhappy that Jesus hadn't been there to heal him. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead anyway, and everyone is super impressed. It could have been a much more compressed story, right? But that's not what we have in the account here. But I want to start out with a couple of, of kind of background pieces as we look at this story. This year in particular, the translation of the text I find to be kind of interesting. In our Thursday morning Bible study, a shout out for our, our Thursday morning Bible study group, we meet at 10.30 in the morning in the narthex with the doors open. We take a look at the readings for the coming Sunday. And one of the fun things uh, about it, one, it's, it's great uh, for whoever is, is preaching that week to be engaged in conversation over the readings, but in particular right now, we're starting to get Bibles showing up in multiple languages. And so it's kind of fun to see how uh, the, the text is translated into different languages. And there are some translational pieces in English that are very traditional for us, and I would argue are just plain wrong and give us a skewed view of Jesus in this text in a way that I find kind of fascinating and I wonder what it says about us American English speakers that we repeatedly choose to mistranslate things in a way that is, I think, a little misleading. One of the things when we see this text, Jesus shows up and you notice that people are pushing back on him a bit. Respectfully, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now he's dead, and I'm pretty upset that you weren't here when he was simply sick. There is this sense of pushing back against Jesus, and Jesus is not quite certain how to respond to this. Others come, they're saying, well, shoot, if he'd been here last week, like those other people he healed, 
we get one of the shortest verses in the New Testament. Jesus wept, right? It's kind of a curious phrase. But it's the beginning of something that I think is important. Jesus in this text is very emotional. Now think about the image of Jesus that you have in your head. I would bet money that for the most of us, Jesus is almost absent of emotions. He's the calm guy in the room, right? People are yelling, hey, you know, let's, let's settle down. Or people are down, hey, it's not so bad. He's the one trying to keep everything in the middle. He's the one with the cleanest clothes in the room. He's so even keel, he's not ever with sheep. He's just with lambs and children, right? Everything is kind of muted and quiet as Jesus goes through. And yet we start this story with him weeping. Doesn't that just make everybody uncomfortable? It's one of those things when you're in a group of people and someone starts crying, there's suddenly this sense of, Who's going to cry next? What, what is it with this crying? What's, what's going on, right? We suddenly get a little uncomfortable at what's going on. And Jesus is the one who's supposed to be in charge, right? And he's breaking down right at the beginning of things. What's going to happen? Things begin to move through, and we get this bizarre phrase in English as Jesus begins to see the grief of the people in regards to the death of Lazarus. He was greatly disturbed in spirit. What does that mean? Have you ever used that phrase? Like you got home from work and say, it's a weird day today. I mean, Bob, he was greatly disturbed in spirit. I don't know what that was about. It's just, what, what does it even mean? Greatly disturbed in spirit. It's a gigantic construction in some ways to move us away from what's going on. In German, the text is that Jesus was angry. Angry. Well, if you come home and say, I don't know what's going on at work today, but Sue was really angry. That makes sense, right? We can kind of picture that. In Japanese, the word is furious. Furious. Furious is, I was at work today, and John was furious and threw his chair. Right? Urgh, furious. And that's... It's like, Jesus, hey, 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 hey. We've got some lambs for you. <sighs> Jesus is weeping. He is furious, furious. Let's take just a, a little step back in the text. We're in the Gospel of John today. At the very beginning of the Gospel of John, beginning, NRK in Hologos. The Greek is, in the beginning was the word. Logos is capitalized in many texts. The word came among us. The word lived among us and became flesh and lived among us. The very word of God, let there be light. And there was light, right? The word spoke into nothing. Let there be light. There was light. The very word of God becomes flesh in Christ. Lazarus come out and the dead man came out. Let there be light. There was light. This is a very direct comparison. This sense that when the word speaks, things happen. When the word speaks, things happen. The very word of God at the beginning of creation, who is seeing the power in his human form of death and brokenness in creation and the pain and wounds and scars of that amongst God's people, 
And he is furious. Furious. We need to be reminded of this. A Jesus who can be angry, who can weep, someone who can be emotional. We often forget that you are not executed by the state on a cross on a hill outside of Jerusalem for being mild-mannered and having great Bible studies. That's not what you get executed for. You get executed because you are seen as dangerous. This guy, he throws too many chairs. Can't have that. This is the Jesus that we see in this text. Now the text begins to move forward. Jesus has this great idea to roll away the stone, and we get this great phrase in there. Whoa, hey, you know, Lazarus died four days ago now. Maybe we should just keep the lid on that. Let's not do that. But Jesus pushes the issue. They roll the stone away. We hear this phrase, Lazarus come out, the dead man came out. But there's an interesting piece to what's happening here. Jesus doesn't finish the job. Now, arguably, he did the heavy lifting in it, right? The, the, the raising from the dead part. But Lazarus comes out, and you can see this in memes and cartoons, you know, kind of mummy-like, right? And he's coming out, and Jesus does not say, oh, hey, buddy, let me help you with those. Or, hey, why don't you take those off? You don't need those anymore. No, Jesus turns to the crowd, we might argue today, turns to us and says, unbind him, let him go. We and they participate in what Jesus is doing in returning Lazarus not just to life, but to life in community as God had called him to be. He was still bound in a way that prevented that. There's a lot of this business of being bound. There is a lot of this business of our work as people of faith in unbinding people so that they might live fully the lives that God has called them to live. Every day in my email box, I know I've mentioned before, I get an email historical lesson from the Equal Justice Initiative that is headed up by Brian Stevenson. Some of you know his book, Just Mercy. It became a movie. This is a series of emails I get that start out with, on this day and this year. And they fill in a lot of the gaps in my own historical education growing up. Um, largely, we tended to focus on what we saw as the heroic American stories and didn't focus quite so much on the less heroic stories. But in 1931, on November 7th, this day, there was a car accident. A gentleman in a Model T crashed into another car that had two black women in it and three college students that were being taken to their home for the weekend. They were seriously injured. The man yelled at them for damaging his car and then drove away without providing any aid. People came to assist, took them to the hospital where they were not treated because it was a segregated hospital. They were taken to a doctor's home where they were treated and over several hours secured a place at a different hospital, but two of them died in this lag of time. Unbind them, let them go. That's an example from 1931, an incident that happened 90 years ago. But as we move through our lives, there are endless numbers of opportunities to reach out and assist those around us in big and small ways that we might continue this work of unbinding. It may be something as simple as giving somebody a ride to get their booster shot, or it might be working with groups 
that encourage larger organizations to be more just in their actions towards society and the world. But if we look at these texts for today on All Saints Sunday, there's a couple of things that I want you to consider. Jesus wept, and Jesus was furious. And that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus called to us to say, unbind him, let him go. And that call and command should be continuing to ring in our ears to this day. So as you go through this week, look for opportunities to unbind and to free. Amen.